morning. Uh, I would like to extend a special welcome to all of our visitors. Um, we're so grateful that you're here with us. Will you, will you please stand up? Come on, if you're visiting, stand up. Right? Welcome. Um, I am going to um, bless you richly right now by showing you a photograph of one of the um, one of the greatest animals that God's ever created. We hit yeah, and keep going. So that's Batty. She's a genetic marvel. Um, uh, yeah, that's her. Uh huh. Keep going. Yeah. So that's Batty. Uh, the photo that you showed first. Will you show that one? That's Batty's father. And then will you show the really ripped American bully up against the fence? Yeah, that's Batty's mother. Um, keep, yeah. Now, just check out the, like, that is one jack dog, right? Uh, so those two dogs created my dog. And I actually have <laughs> that dog. <laughs> I have a purpose in telling you, you can kill him now, yeah. So I actually have a reason in telling you this. It may be slightly far flung, but we're gonna make it work. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a truth about Batty. Uh, she is the sweetest, I want to be with you dog that I've ever been around. Now you can ask uh, Allison Andrews if this is true. Uh, you can talk to Rachel Haynes, uh, you can talk um, talk to the folks. Um, but Batty wants to be with you. But you would not know it if you first met her. When you first walk in the door of my home, she will stay a good four feet. She'll run up. She'll look at you. Then she'll turn around and run away. She'll do the same. After a while, when she kind of gets comfortable with you, then she'll come, especially if you have food. If you have food, she's, she's very food motivated. The vet asked us, is your dog food motivated? If there's like a single Cheerio under the refrigerator from like nine months ago, she will find it. Um, but in time, when you spend time with Batty, she will eventually crawl up and she just wants to be on your lap or she wants to crawl up and like sit on the back of the chair and rest on my shoulders. That's who she is. But you have to look closely. And that's what we're going to do this morning because the passage we're going to read and look at on first view, if you don't dig and if you don't do some careful looking at it, it may not be what you think it is. And I'm going to tell you what this is about is a God who desires to be with his people. A God who desires to be with his people. And the reason we're going to look at this passage in particular is because this passage is one of those passages that a lot of people read and say, why would we want a God like that who wants to be with his people? And that's why we'll dig and have some fun. So um, we believe that God desires to speak to us and that God desires to meet us where we are right now and that as we read, as we pray together, as I speak, that God has something that he wants you to hear that may transform your heart, may transform your mind, that you may know him better. So will you take just a moment and pray that God would speak to you where you are and what you need to hear right now? Father God, we come before you humbly, knowing that you desire to speak to your people. Will you please do that now? And will you give us tender hearts and tender ears that we might hear what you have to say to us? We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. The passage I'm going to read is 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord God Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They set the Ark on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. 
When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with great rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. God desires to be with his people. It is a thread that has played out through all of Scripture with a closeness and an intimacy that outstrips our imaginations. When we think of the closest human relationships that we have, they're just tastes of the desire that God has to be with his people. But here we sit in a passage where it looks like God may be somewhat capricious in the way that he acts. Let's dig in and see what happens. Uh, context first. What is going on with the Ark of God? Why is David wanting to bring it up and where has it been? So following the capture of the Ark of God, the Philistines had the Ark and the Philistines had it uh, for, for a time. Um, during the reign of Saul, Saul in his disobedience had gone out against the Philistines. The Philistines had captured the Ark as uh, Hophni and Phinehas, the, the priests were out, they died in battle. The Philistines take the Ark and the Ark in turn is initially taken to the temple of Dagon. And as the ark is there, the living God begins to cast curses and um, uh, uh, boils on the people of the Philistines, right? So he, I'm trying to think, what's the word I want? Uh, what does he do? Um, what is it? Oh, sorry, I wanted a word there. Uh, but anyway, with the ark of God and the presence of God, he casts judgment upon the people, and they break out in disease and boils, and they're really awful. So the ark is then passed to the five cities of uh, the Philistines, and in each city, God judges the people, and they finally say, we need to get rid of this ark. The ark is casting judgment off upon our people. So they send it away, and they send it off uh, with two um, cows um, and uh, they are cows that are, that are milking. Um, they have babies that they pen up. The nat natural thing would be for the cows to turn around and go to their babies, but they head straight for Israel, and they go to Beth Shemesh. They get to Beth Shemesh, and the Israelites see the ark coming, um, and it's on a cart, on a wooden cart. It's pulling it along, and as it gets to the people, the people rejoice because the ark of God is back with the Israelites. And as it's there, Scripture tells us that some 70 of the people from Beth Shemesh come, and they look into the ark and God strikes 70 people dead for looking into the ark. So they take it to the house of Abinadab, and there it sits for 20 years. And in that 20-year time, you have a movement from uh, Saul's kingship to David's kingship. And the Lord blesses David's kingship. He blesses the kingdom of Israel during that time. And during that time, he takes uh, over, they attack, and they uh, take the city of uh, Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And when they take Jerusalem, David's going to kind of centralize the the. Um, locale of Jerusalem. That's going to be the city of David. And there in the city of David, he feels deeply blessed. Um, but he said, it's not right for the ark of the living God not to be in our midst. So that's what they're doing. They're going, they're going to get the ark and they're going to bring it back. So scripture tells us that story. Some 30,000 men come down and it's a great time of celebration. They're going to the house of Abinadab and they're going to carry the ark back to be in the midst of the people of God. So they go down with great celebration. There's music, there's shouting. The ark is placed again, scripture tells us, on a new cart. And as the cart is pulled along, 
They get to the threshing floor of Nacon, and the oxen stumble, and it looks like the ark is going to go down. And Uzzah reaches out, grabs a hold of the ark, and steadies it. And you would think that the motive there is good, that Uzzah is doing a good thing by keeping the ark of God from falling off of the cart. But God, because of this irreverent act, actually strikes Uzzah dead, and Uzzah dies there by the ark of God. David, in his anger at what has happened, calls the place Perez Uzzah, but he also understands and rationalizes, oh goodness, this ark cannot come and be with me because I know my sin. So he instead sends it to the house of Obed-Edom, a Gittite, one of the like, I think, greatest backhanded gifts in all of history. Like, here, you take it, let's see what happens, right? So it sits in the house of Obed-Edom uh, for three months, and God blesses those people richly. But stop there for a moment before we look at what happens after. It would appear at this point that God acted capriciously in his judgment that the motive of heart of Uzzah was good, right? That here, here's the ark of God being brought out on a cart. It's on its way to Jerusalem to once again be in the midst of his people. The oxen stumble and Uzzah, wanting to protect and be good, stops the ark from falling off of the cart. That's the appearance. That's what happened. But here's what should have happened. If you go back and you look at scripture, there are a group of Levites called the Kohathites, of which Ahio and Uzzah are two. And the Kohathites were tasked with moving the holy things of God from the tabernacle. The way that it is set down in Scripture is very clear. The way that the ark was to be moved, the ark was to be moved by Levites first going in, the sons of Aaron, and they would take the curtain that separated the holies from the rest of the temple. They would lay that over the ark. And then they would take a great piece of leather and put that great piece of leather over the curtain. And then they would take a piece of blue linen and place that over the ark. And then they would place poles through the circles on the bottom on the feet of the ark. And it was only by those poles that the ark was to be carried. Scripture is really clear. It says that the Kohathites were never to touch one of the holy things says that the Kohathites were never to even go in and look upon the holy things, even for a moment, or they would die. What should have happened is when they started bringing the ark of God out on a new cart, all of our spidey senses should have gone, "Uh uh-oh, what's happening here? This is how the Philistines treated the ark. This is not how the Israelites and the Kohathites treat the ark of God. Uzzah goes and touches the ark, and God in righteous judgment puts him to death. But that is not an act of severe judgment. What we're actually looking at is an act of severe mercy, because rightly what should have happened is that the entire assembly of celebration should have been put to death for casting eyes on the holy things of God. The Kohathites, the Levites, they should have known this, That ark should have been covered, 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 pulled, and carried. And that's not what happened. And God, in his mercy, in the midst of holy judgment, is gracious to his people. Well, while the ark is there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, Scripture tells us, and if 1 Chronicles 15 is your favorite passage, you'll know this. Um, Scripture tells us that David started thinking, oh, no, we did not inquire of the Lord as to how we were supposed to move it. So he goes to the holy writings, he goes to the scriptures, he talks to the priests. They return again to get the ark, but this time when they return, they return with the priests consecrated. They return with the same amount of celebration and joy, but this time the priests are prepared. This time they go and they cover the ark. This time they carry it with poles. And this time, David, wearing a linen ephod, priestly garments, they go six steps, and he offers a blood sacrifice for his people. This is a true worship, not just excitement, but an understanding of the holiness and the magnitude of what is happening. And they take the Ark of the Living God into the city of David. So that story that initially appears like God may be perhaps a capricious God who's 
who's not understanding or caring about the motives of people and is being mean-spirited by striking down Uzzah. It's actually just the opposite. Holy, sinful man cannot touch the mercy seat of the living God. But God can extend mercy to the people with whom he wants to dwell. And that's what happens. So let that, let that kind of sit for us and catapult us forward a little bit. We want to follow this theme of God desiring to be with his people. After Israel profanes the name of the Lord over and over and over, and we get to the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, there's 400 years of silence where the presence of God is actually removed from his people. And then centuries later, 400 years, Jesus Christ is born. The Son of God, the King who will sit on the Davidic throne forever, the Word of God who becomes flesh and tabernacles in our midst. God once again in the midst of his people, from the mercy seat of the ark to human flesh that he takes on, as Paul says, the one in whom the fullness of God dwelt in bodily form. Now here is the Messiah. Here is God once again in the midst of his people, this time in fleshed. But what happens when people reach out their hands and touch God in flesh? Remember the woman with the issue of blood who lives her life when she's in the midst of people yelling, unclean, unclean, unclean. She sneaks through a crowd of people and she reaches out just to touch his garment. She gets a hold of his garment and he turns and he finds her and his final word to her is, daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace. Another woman, uh, Luke, calls her a sinner. She comes, and as Jesus is reclining at a table, eating the house of a Pharisee, she comes and overwhelmed by mercy, by love, by, by this crazy understanding of who he is, she weeps on his feet, and with her hair, touches and wipes his feet. And what does Jesus say to that woman? He says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. God enfleshed, fully God, fully man, when touched by other sinful humans, offers instead of judgment or death, offers peace and mercy. His disciples at the transfiguration, remember, when they catch just the slightest glimpse of him, they fall to the ground, their faces on the ground. And scripture says that Jesus came and he touched them. He says, do not be afraid. Peace, the removal of fear. And then the crazy one, he allows wicked, evil men to touch him, to take him to the cross, to strip him bare, and to nail him onto the tree in our place. Again, so that he could dwell with his people, taking our sin upon himself so that we might be reconciled to God and that we might once again have relationship with our living God. But for God who wants to be with his people, being incarnate could not be the final chapter of the story. Because when incarnate, you're locked into space and time, and God's desire to be with his people is even greater. So, after his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, the promised Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit comes and indwells those whom God calls his own, those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ. And notice the constant movement closer and closer and closer towards his people. The movement of a God who desires to be with his people. And now we have a new reality. The people of God become the indwelt temple of God's presence. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? He seals us for redemption. He calls us his own and he dwells in our midst. So think about this. Just look around this room, right? God sitting on the mercy seat. God enfleshed. God indwelt. God who desires to be in the midst of his people. 
And you would think you could almost do kind of a mic drop at that point, like, right? God wants to be with his people. It's accomplished and it worked. God more intimately dwelling with his people than we could ever imagine because the Holy Spirit actually lives in and transforms and makes us alive, makes us able to be called children of God. But it doesn't stop there. And here we get to kind of the, the meat, right? That is all very cool and amazing biblical theology that flows out and you can see the heart of God for his people. But there's deep purpose in this. Our world has a message that you hear, I think, somewhat frequently. And the message is this, that deep purpose is found by digging down into yourself and finding truth. You mine down into the depths and the wells of your soul and you discover your truth. And then the good life is living out that truth before the world. The biblical narrative says that you have a deeper purpose than you could ever discover in yourself because it's given to you by God and it's in consort with his eternal desire to be with his people. Look, we don't discover our truth. Our truth is given to us. Our truth is the one who indwells us. And the good life, the good life is carrying the hope and the love and the glory of Jesus to the rest of the world because God desires to dwell with his people. That's being salt and light. Like, I know a lot of you are, are prospective students here. You're, you're thinking about where you're going to go, go to college. You're thinking about what am I going to do with my life? What's my vocation going to be? What is my purpose? And that question, what is my purpose, transcends all of those other questions. All those other questions flow out from that. Your purpose is to carry the love and the hope of Jesus to the people around you. To those who know the Father, to those who don't know the Father. Sit in that for just a second. Your purpose is to continue carrying the God who desires to dwell with his people to his people. That's crazy. But by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit, we can actually do it. If you grab a hold of that, and if you chew on that, and you actually believe that, it will transform your life. It will transform the way that you encounter and act with one another. It will transform the way that you encounter and act with the world. God desires to be with his people. He desires to be with you, and he desires for you to be the agent by which his hope and his love and his glory will be extended to others. But it doesn't stop there. Now we get the, the, the final like, uh, right? So when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, when you get to the culmination of all salvation history, when you get to the new heavens and the new earth, the, the ultimate plan that God has had from the very beginning of time what does it look like? What sits at the heart of it? Here's what it is. Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and he shall tabernacle among them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them and be their God. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Nor shall there be mourning or crying or pain any longer for the former things have passed away. What God calls us to, by virtue of the love and the power of Jesus Christ, by the indwelling spirit that he gives us, he calls us to take part in that story every single day of our lives. He gives us a purpose that is very immediate and now, but so wonderfully eternal. We get to carry the love the hope, the glory of God with us everywhere we go because God indwells us. 
And we know that one day that's what we will look forward to. We will actually see God as he is face to face. But no more death, no more tears, no more sorrow. The rejoicing that you saw with David and the 30,000 taken to its true and utter perfection. Folks, this is the hope that we have in the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, will you please take the truths of your love for us, the truths of our identity in you, and the truths of our purpose, and bury them deep within our hearts that they might transform us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.